analysts for the Asset Management Outlook, moderated by New York Times reporter Kate Kelly. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the asset management aspect of navigating an uncertain future. Um, I, uh, I want to start off with the premise of this panel, which is that we're going to see an explosion, really, in the growth of assets under management. Uh, according to a study conducted late last year by PwC, by 2025, Global AUM will reach $145 trillion, up from a current $85 trillion. Uh, some of the areas that are going to grow in a huge way are retail and ETFs, uh, alternative assets, including real estate. Active management will grow, but it will be outpaced by passive management. So I want to start off with that question because it seems to be one of the most urgent facing your, industries today, your industry today. Um, how do you adapt to a world in which passive investing is becoming ever more successful and popular, and how do you kind of stay relevant under that, those circumstances? Noble, let me start with you. Okay. You're, you're uh, Two Sigma, founded in 2001. Um, it's $50 billion in assets under management. Two-thirds of your staff is in research and development, only one-third financially oriented. Um, so you've been using data for a long time to guide your investing. How, what shifts do you see right now, and how do the trends I just mentioned affect Two Sigma? So, um, thanks, Kelly. Uh, we were founded on a very simple vision, which is that data and technology was going to affect every industry, including investment management. And so our company was founded in 2001, right around the time where this profound change was affected the U.S. equity markets. But what started there has really propagated to every market around the world, many, many equity markets around the world, many futures and options and, and markets. And one by one, we see that the regulation, the transparency, the, the data, the electronification allows for more scientific approaches to prevail over um, you know, uh, historical ones. It's more of a level playing field, they're more efficient markets, and, and that is true. I think looking at from the asset allocator's perspective, the same is true as well. I think what we're going to see is technology. There are two things that are contributing. One is the low-rate environment that we're facing now, which I think is shedding the light and the focus on the on part of our clients to really uh, you know, ask some hard questions that maybe didn't need to be asked over the last couple of decades. And the second is the same technology that we are using to select securities I think that is now available in enabling asset allocators to think through how they achieve their goals. Uh, ultimately, there is a, a finite number of goals, there's a finite number of constraints that investors have, and yet the industry hasn't done them a service by offering them thousands and tens of thousands of seemingly undifferentiated uh, and often not value-added products, especially net of fees. And so if you put the power back in the hands of the allocator, which I think technology is doing and will do, people are going to have the opportunity to kind of rethink completely what how to achieve their goals and how to deploy uh, you know, the $140 trillion worth of, uh, uh, of assets. And they probably think in terms of risks. Uh, and so the whole definition of alpha, beta, etc., passive is passive. That's fine. And I think that that you know, today stands at around 25% of the world's assets. Maybe it'll grow a little bit more. Uh, it's fine. I don't think it's going to get to you know, 80%. I don't think that uh, we're going to see that. But it'll grow a little bit more. The real reclassification we're starting to see now is within active, there is starting to become a bifurcation between true alpha, which is very, very rare, and effectively uh, various forms of risk premium collection. And I think investors are becoming more savvy and more demanding on that transparency, on paying the appropriate fees, on, uh, on achieving the, the, the right alignment, and, and, and so on. So I think that's going to be a tremendous trend, uh, which ultimately will favor investors over the next decade. Um, David Hunt, uh, you manage over a trillion dollars at PGM. You guys put out a ton of research on the markets, the, the trends that you're perceiving, uh, how you're positioning yourselves uh, to respond to what's happening. Um, what are your thoughts on the active versus passive trend, um, and how are you guys adapting to that? 
Sure, I think that uh, the single biggest trend that we uh, see in the industry right now, um, which builds on the growth that you were talking about, is the fundamental blurring of uh, alternatives and privates together with public securities. The two grew up uh, in history very separately. So there was a way of managing long-only assets, there was a way of managing alternatives, there were uh, pay approaches and carry and other things that went with one group and not another. The industry even was covered by different analysts, if you actually read the, the, the coverage uh, from, the, from the sell side. And that is really starting to change. And we always felt a little bit that we were an odd duck because we have kind of a mix of both. We have a big real estate business, big privates business, a big infrastructure business, and we also have a big public securities business, mostly in fixed income. But what we're seeing is that actually more and more people now are coming in. So the alternatives guys are deciding they'd like to get into long only. Thank you very much. And there's a long list of that. And the long only guys are deciding that they'd really like to get into private <coughs> credit. And you've seen uh, quite, a lot, uh, quite a lot of that. So these things are coming together. And last week, quite an amazing fact. Um, Actually, the, the, the valuations of these two universes uh, came together at the same number. So it's always been the long-only guys were valued at a much higher level, usually uh, you know, at, a, at, a, at a premium to the market. Recently, it's been at a discount. Um, the alternatives guys were never given much respect and always had a re really low multiple. Um, those now have converged. Uh, the, current, uh, the current PE is 11 for both of those groups. Mm. And so the market is now deciding that while performance fees and the accounting that goes with the alternatives is difficult to understand, the growth that's inherent in it is actually more than making up uh, for that. So we're really seeing these coming together. And, and the question for us and the things we're trying to do is to find how to blend those two together so that we can you know, put together products that somebody like Ron um, can really use to meet his long-term liabilities. And uh, I think that's the really exciting change that you're seeing in the, in the market. If you're a small, long-only public securities firm, I think you've got a pretty tough road ahead. Mm. Ron O'Hanley, I assume you're spending a lot of time thinking about this. You are soon to become the CEO of State Street. Uh, you guys manage $2.8 trillion um, apart from your overall business, your custodial business. You have benefited, certainly, from the rise of ETFs. How do you see the ETF business progressing over five to 10 years, and how will you guys cope with the sort of the resurgence of passive investing? Well, I mean, the, if, if you think about the way the ETF business started, it was very much around institutions buying these, these vehicles that were easily traded, uh, that could be used uh, to get positions on quickly, to be able to hedge positions. And that really is how it all got started. The, the acceleration of it has been a little bit picking up on Noble's point here. It's the rise of the asset allocator and the desire for high quality, low cost building blocks. And if you think about it, if you're an asset allocator trying to put together a portfolio for an individual, uh, the ETF is a very efficient way to do that. It gives you liquidity, it gives you transparency. It's something that the, your end user customer understands. And that really has what's propelled much of what we've seen uh, over the last couple of years. As much as institutional ETFs holding have, have risen, it's been this switch from uh, traditional active uh, mutual funds to and met some kind of a managed portfolio, some kind of an allocated portfolio with the ETF serving as building blocks. And I think you'll see that trend continue. Um, Steve Goulart, uh, you are managing about $600 billion in assets. Um, how do you, and, and you're operating in an environment where there's been a lot of consolidation. Uh, there's a great growth opportunity. How, how are you positioning for the next five to 10 years? Sure. I, I think there are going to be great opportunities for folks like us in the, in the uh, next years in coming. I'd go back, though, and I, I want to comment on just some of the things that were said uh, so far, too, and try and put a little context on it, uh, because it, it does depict the environment that we're in now. And, uh, and I'd point out a couple of things on David Hunt's comments about you know, asset classes merging. Think about the environment we've been in. You know, we've been in a low-rate macro environment for a long time, and yields are compressed across all asset classes. So there's sort of a blurring that's happened anyway. And I think the result of that is, and, and this is what drives so many trends across the industry and our businesses anyway, is 
what are the customers looking for? What do customers need? I mean, that's what's most critical to us. So as customers have been faced with this environment, uh, firms like us uh, have been trying to come up with the solutions for them too. And that means spreading across into asset classes that perhaps they weren't in before. And you look at things like private assets and illiquid assets and how they're being um, really marketed and, and invested in across a broader spectrum than they used to be. So that's how we started our asset management business, really, was focusing on private assets because managing the MetLife General account, it's something that we've always been comfortable with. Um, you know, for the last three years, you know, we've been putting more than 50% of our new money investments into private or illiquid assets, things like commercial mortgages, corporate private placements, private infrastructure debt, and even a little bit of real estate equity, too. So those are asset classes we're very comfortable with, and we look at that, that sort of fit with the trend of what we've seen over the last several years, and I think will allow us to continue to grow the business. I do think, you know, Kate, you mentioned, you, you touched on uh, consolidation, what's happening in the industry. You know, I think you did. If not, I'm going to take that anyway. I did. But <laughs> You're right. Well, two but, major deals, two but, major mergers in the last year or so, and, and yeah. probably more to come. Well, and, you know, we started on a small way last year. We bought uh, Logan Circle Partners, which manages about $38 billion now in, in uh what I call really specialty fixed income, uh, short, medium, long duration credit, emerging markets. That fits well with uh, what we've been doing for the general account and it'll allow us to, 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 to continue to grow that business. But consolidation in general, I think, again, I think a lot of it is driven by what I talked about. What are customer preferences? What's happening with the needs of our customers and investors over time? And you think about you know, the spectrum, spectrum of asset managers. You know, there may be some small specialists that can continue because they have great track records and are really in demand. But the more you go up the scale and you think about some of the other trends, regulation, technology, you know, workforce needs, a lot of the middle kind of middle market firms uh, will probably won't have the capital to invest. So they'll be looking uh, for their best way to compete longer term. And then the big firms, uh, I think, you know, they continue to sort of move across all asset classes. Mm -hmm. Ron Mock, let me get to you here. Uh, you, you manage $190 billion, Canadian dollars, uh, of assets on behalf of more than 300,000 Ontario teachers, Correct. active or retired. Yep. Um, you guys have been quite innovative with your assets under management, doing everything from direct infrastructure investing to private equity style investing to you know, public equities. What is the next frontier for you? Well, it's interesting. We're actually working through a lot of that process uh, currently. Just a little background. We, we, we have both passive and active management. Where we think we can um, access relatively inexpensively market beta, we'll go out and do that. So we're users of all the various products that are here, hedge funds, everything. Um, where teachers in the last 25, 27 years has really excelled is being a little bit different than most pension plans. We actually have created um, active management. By active management, I mean uh, we literally go out and buy companies. We'll go out and buy companies. We'll buy minority positions, majority positions. We'll buy them 100%. And our active management plays out not necessarily in the role of stock picking, although this is security selection, but it's in how we um, get inside a company how we will deal with management, how we'll drive EBITDA growth. And we've created around the world on our global platform uh, something quite unique, which is we call them platforms. And so, for example, in real estate, we have a company. It's called Cadillac Fairview. Cadillac Fairview has about 1,600 employees. We'll buy land. We'll have it rezoned we'll construct, we'll build Class A downtown office buildings. And that platform is used to invest in real estate all the way from North America to South America into Brazil and everywhere else in Mexico. And we will partner and build and engage. In Chile, for example, where we deliver 30, 40% of the water supply throughout northern Chile, Santiago and North, we have a platform, and as we build out transmission lines and water facilities, we do it through these operating company platforms. And so it's an active management style that's probably quite unique than others up on the panel here. But we've found that we've been able to uh, pretty much outperform our benchmark over the last 27 years by one and a half to two percent. 
um, which has worked out nicely. The returns have worked out nicely. Well, in the pension fund world right now, that's highly unusual. Well, in the pension fund world, we're, I, I, we're actually in a pretty good spot. Our, our values, our corporate values, humility is always number one, and so <laughs> I'm going to hang there with the number one humility, humble, but, but uh, we're a defined benefit plan. Um, we are in a surplus. We have one of the lowest discount rates in the industry at 2.75% real. And um, with a surplus of about 10 to $15 billion, I think we can continue to look forward to pay pensions for the teachers of Ontario uh, for generations to come. Innovation going forward, um, uh, we're really focused on investing with our global partners in the whole world of tech. And by that, I mean buying into tech companies that are pre-IPO, and whether that's in China, whether that's throughout Asia, whether that's throughout North America, um, we're very heavily and actively involved in those areas, and that is continuing to grow for us uh, as well. So a, a little bit, our, our definition of active is just a little bit different. Let me ask you a follow-up question, and I, I hope that after Ron answers, you guys will feel free to jump in as well, because I know a lot of people have thoughts on this, which is responsible investing, or ESG. Yes. Um, sensitivities to investing. Uh, you guys have a, a pretty robust um, thought process there. I'm glad you mentioned the Chilean water utility because things like that or the microfinance business in India that you invested in, these are things that uh, could be well regarded as responsible investing, but also I assume you're getting into them because you expect to see a healthy return. So. What is your uh, thought process for evaluating both ESG factors and returns in tandem? So, um, this, this is a very, very important issue for us, and I think it's going to become more and more important for the asset management industry going forward. It already is. It's got to be inculcated into all of this. First point is we're a fiduciary. That means we've got to earn the return to pay pensions for generations to come. And we have to look through that lens. But through the lens of risk, um, environmental social governance are critically, critically important to us. We've been on the governance piece for a very, very long time. And certainly in Canada, we're a poster child for that one. On the environmental front, um, uh, we are very, very actively involved if we can get the return that we need. Um, and so whether it's uh, electric utilities, we run renewables and wind farms in eight different countries around the world, um, battery technology, microgrids, all of this is quite frankly critically important, um, not just because it's a feel-good thing, but because we actually believe that these are new opportunities going forward and we want to be in them. One of the most difficult areas that we are dealing with right now is the social piece. Um, and the social piece is not easy. So let me just lay the stage for a second. Um, uh, 330,000 teachers. Teachers generally are very uh, societally oriented. They always want to make things better. And so they have a very strong voice. They are our captive customers. And so um, think about Florida. Think about guns in the classroom, think about automatic weapons in the classroom. If you think that we have not heard from our teachers mm -hmm. about the companies that we invest in that may in fact be part and parcel of um, uh, selling retail or otherwise or manufacturing weapons, um, you'd be sadly mistaken because we seriously hear about this stuff. How many inbound calls or emails since Parkland? Oh, it's worse than that. I mean, when I do the annual general meeting and there's a thousand teachers standing in front of me and there's 10,000 on webcast, you can bet that it is a major, major subject, top of mind. So the social part, livable wage, all of these issues enter into our thinking now. Um, and we have very clear guidelines that we've developed because there's a slippery slope here. As an asset, and this is true now, we're finding ESG issues when we allocate money out to our asset managers. It's critically important that we engage with them around their ESG practices. But, I'll, but this is key. We have to earn the return. We have to make sure that we are not on the slippery slope of every latest thought process. So for example, if they don't like oil because they think it's greenhouse gases, 
Well, if you're not going to invest in oil companies, does that mean that you also don't invest in the banks that lend to the oil companies? So where does that stop? This is a very emotionally charged issue that we are very actively involved in almost on a daily basis. Um, won't bore everybody here with it, but I can tell you, uh, this is something that's not going to go away. And, um, but on the other hand, we have to deliver the returns. Um, it's not about a feel-good thing. This is about being uh, a fiduciary, earning the return, but also acknowledging that the risks of some of these things <clears throat> and engagement with the companies that we invest in is critically, critically important to get inside of that. And when we allocate uh, money out to various people, um, it's becoming more and more important that we take that risk lens to the people to whom we allocate assets so that they can also start thinking about it in the same way that we do. Ron O'Hanley? Yeah, <clears throat> I think Ron's made some very important points, and I think it becomes easier to think about this if you think about investing for the long term. And we're, we've been in this odd situation for a long time now where there is a very, there's a lot of reasons why investors have a short-term focus, but if you think about the liabilities, I mean, you think about the pension obligations that Ron has to meet, these are very long-term liabilities. And in our mind, ESG and long-term uh, are quite synonymous. And I'd also add that, um, that th there's been a kind of an evolution of thinking. When we first started talking about ESG, I called it the thou shalt not, right? They were the socially <laughs> responsible products. Mm. You know, thou shalt not invest in tobacco, thou shalt not invest in, you know, guns, whatever it was. Then we moved to the thou shalt, right? Thou shalt buy clean energy, thou shalt do things like that. The, what we're, the, the stage we're in now and what we need to fully complete is this idea of integrating ESG into the investment risk framework. Because that's really what this is about. I mean, if you think about climate change and uh, rising sea levels, I don't know, there's 300 people in this room, there's 300 different opinions on that. Well, that's the definition of risk, right? That more things can happen than will happen. So we've got to incorporate these things in a systematic way into the investment risk framework. And it's right, governance in some ways, we all started in governance because it was the easiest and the immediate to do, and we could push on it now with the idea that that would have impact down the road. Environmental, again, as the technology and the science has become clearer, social is more difficult, but if you, think, if you start to think about the nature of the liabilities of the people whose money we're managing, it's not our money, and most of these liabilities are actually long dated, either a pension obligation, somebody's trying to save for a child's education, whatever it is, that starts to put you in the frame of there's a set of issues. Sure, quarterly earnings are important. Can't forget about those. But we've got these long-term issues that are going to be here for the duration of those liabilities and have to be incorporated into the investment risk framework. You guys have recently made a push toward greater gender parity in the boardroom of companies that you're invested in. How active are you at the moment in, when you think about voting your shares uh, at annual <laughs> meetings over various uh, proxy items or other issues? Yeah, so we, we've been active in governance for a long time, and our focus has always been on the board because we believe, listen, we, if you look at all of our uh, portfolios, it's roughly 7,000 different companies we're invested in. We can't possibly tell any, any one of those companies what to do. We're not fundamental analysts at that level. Right, but we do believe that effective, independent, and strong board leadership is in fact what's required to get good governance. So we put out, we, we study that carefully, we do a fair amount of research on what is it that leads to effective, independent, and strong board governance, and put out principles. And there was, in the case of More gender, women. very, very <laughs> conclusive evidence that companies that had more women in leadership positions, including boards, perform better over the long term. So that was an easy principle to put out. In terms of how we vote, again, um, what we're looking for is that boards are making a move in these directions. So if they're not making a move, we will vote against it. What we but remember in a passive portfolio, we don't have the freedom to walk away. Right? The ultimate freedom to express your opinion is say, I'm out of here. We can't do that. I can't turn the S&P 500 
into the S&P 499, just because I don't happen to like one company. So it's through this engagement, and uh, it's much better for us to engage with management, to let them know what our beliefs and principles are, what we're going to be looking for here, and let them act on their own. And that's far better than voting against them. Other thoughts on I, ESG? I'll, yeah, I'll jump in, Kate. Uh, I, I, the most important words were uh, words Ron mentioned, slippery slope, because this yes. clearly is a slippery slope. But, but uh, we're not dissimilar in some ways from Ontario teachers at MetLife uh, from a general account investing perspective. And, and what I say in this situation is we're not really doing our jobs as investors if we're not taking into account all risk factors that could impact the viability of an investment. We're doing a lot of long-term investing. So we ha have to think about, before we invest in any corporate bond, you know, what are the different environmental aspects, governance aspects, and the like that could impact that because we expect to hold that bond for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So it really is part of your, part of your job in our business, I think. Uh, th th that's critical to get across. I'll come back, though, to, uh, because I think um, uh, both Rons were touching on the point that I made in an earlier statement, which is customer preference. And that's where a lot of this is going, is what do your customers want? Uh, and so I think that's why we're seeing uh, ESG as a kind of a broad category really start to explode in popularity is because customers do want that product. And so people are creating the product that will satisfy those customer needs. And so again, it's just, it's, a, it's an uh, area of meeting choice, really. Um, I do, there, sorry, one more comment um, in, in a competitor publication of yours recently, uh, there was an interesting essay on uh, a, a pension fund and how to deal with ESG because it did go back to, you know, Ron mentioned, on, mentioned this too, what's your ultimate obligation? It's to earn the best return you can for that retiree. Mm -hmm. So put it in that context. Everything else you do needs to meet that obligation. Well, sure. And, and the U.S. Labor Department last week uh, offered guidance on ESG investing saying that 401ks should not necessarily be invested uh, in an ESG-minded way because the returns are uncertain. Does that bother you? I mean, they're touching on an issue that you're well aware of, right? It depends how you slice it. And there is limited evidence, isn't there? there well, there's a lot of evidence, uh, but there are ESG a lot of different studies. That ESG is an effective investing right. strategy? I, I think you can find a number of different studies that show a number of different results sure. at this point. Sure. Because a lot of it still has to do with defining the category and what do you mean by it, what's included, what's not and how do you measure returns and compare returns. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to ask about uh, the market environment we're in. Um, obviously, 2018 is off to a volatile start after a surprisingly uh, robust and non-volatile 2017. Um, interest rates are uh, backing up perhaps more quickly than people might have expected. We were just talking in the green room about in the annual report uh, for MetLife, there's a projection that... Um, uh, rate, uh, ten year yields will reach four and a quarter uh, within ten years. I, I know that 's just one set of assumptions to kind of establish the economics of the life insurance products right but I, I call it sensitivity, <laughs> not prediction <laughs> right right i 'm sorry <laughs> um, but is this moving more quickly than expected? How are all of you having to adjust your models? Um, I believe most, if not all of you, are heavily involved uh, in credit products of all stripes. so David, can I start with you? Sure. Well, the first point I would make is that uh, while volatility is a good deal higher this year, this is actually much more normal than 2017. Mm -hmm. So 2017 should be viewed as a very strange period of mm -hmm. quietness in, in the market. But I think more fundamentally, um, as long-term investors, it's very important to recognize that volatility is not risk. Um, for us, we will lose money if we have to take an impairment on an asset or if we sell an asset below what we bought it. The fact that the market goes up or down or the interest rate goes up or down a little bit is an unrealized piece in our portfolio and for many of our clients. And that's a really important factor. Because in many ways, for long-term investors, uh, a bit of volatility is actually a good thing. Um, and in fact, if we look out in, in, at the environment, um, the biggest risk that we face is putting a lot of money to work in an, env in, in an environment where everything's richly priced. So some volatility, even some pullback in the market, uh, for us would actually be a good thing. It would enable our, our long-term investors to get in at a better price point. 
And so um, we think that uh, the, the, the rise of a lot of short-term money, which has given uh, also rise to these vol models, uh, gotten to the point where we're trading on the VIX, is really an unhealthy uh, situation. Unhealthy. Unhealthy situation. Um, and we need to go back to the definition of what real risk is and do much tougher work on that. And I'll take an example, political risk. So... Um, after Brexit, many of our clients uh, really asked themselves the tough question, what's our exposure to the UK? Mm. And they had a very hard time coming up with the answer to that. It certainly wasn't the FTSE 100, it wasn't the FTSE 250. The real estate portfolio was spread about around Europe, their private credit was uh, spread around Europe. And so we worked with a lot of clients to actually try to quantify what that uh, would look like. And it's, it's quite a task. Mm -hmm. And we've never really done risk in a way that looks at the political risk of developed countries. Mm -hmm. Because that doesn't follow the nice kind of Bayesian normal curves that we all use in the models. It's a very binary factor, but it's very fundamental uh, in the way in which money is managed. So we think people, uh, long-term investors anyway, will move away from this, you know, vol measures and much more towards scenarios scenario-based views in, in their portfolios. I do want to talk about geopolitics, but I have a question for you. Um, what about the liquidity factor in the current regulatory environment? I mean, speaking of market volatility, uh, I often hear people on Wall Street that I cover warn that because of the regulatory apparatus that was put in place after the financial crisis, banks in particular are using less balance sheet to try to make markets and offset disruptions. Um, Outside of the S&P 500 and G7 government debt and other highly liquid products, do you worry that we will see a real liquidity shock and market disruption in the coming year or two? And if so, in what type of area? It, it is entirely possible. It is true that since the global financial crisis, the regulation and the posture of banks and the capital charges that they have to incur has changed their posture in terms of liquidity provision, especially in some of the, the, the fixed income products and some of the OTC markets. And we've seen uh, you know, a significant reduction in their balance sheets. And as a result, for our business, we gravitate first and foremost towards liquid markets. And that's by design. We like liquid markets. Equities is one of our biggest. Futures are extremely liquid. And so we try to mitigate that risk by effectively pre-selecting the, the assets that we trade uh, on the condition. I think it's far, liquidity is available in equities far deeper than the S&P 500. Our universe uh, is far broader than that, and especially on a global basis, it's, uh, uh, it's far better. But it is true that in some of the, the illiquid uh, products or the OTC products, uh, should there be a crisis, I think that liquidity will only exacerbate that. And I think just to b build on that, it's very important to have a look at the equity markets and what's happened there. So our equity markets actually are not in good health. Um, we have now uh, you know, literally half the number of publicly traded companies in the U.S. than we did uh, 15 years ago. The level of IPOs is at almost an all-time low, despite all of the technology uh, advances that are being uh, made. Uh, and at the same time, private equity is raising more money than they ever have before. And so effectively, the equity slice of the American economy is increasingly being owned by private equity and not by public investors. Mm. And that is a form of uh, a, 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 a structure that is able to absorb illiquidity better than the public markets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons that that's, that's happening. But it's also troubling, right, because um, We've had a bit of a social contract in this country that you know individual investors would have an ability to invest in fast growth technology companies, and they're not anymore. Um, those companies are staying private, and I think that that is a, a real issue for us as we look at the equity markets and figure out how to make that again work for everyone. I think that move. I think that move though to the private side, which is an interesting comment, which we see more and, and, and more of, is that. A lot of the companies that we've either taken private or have private see it as um, a, a way to actually get out of the limelight, the quarterly right. reporting limelight. Um, strategically, if they want to um, uh, think about you know, the next five years and where they'll invest, but, but their boards, for example, are very focused on what's the quarterly earnings looking like they know that they can't grow in the same way that, that they want to. And so I, I know we're, we're a member of a, uh, something called Focusing Capital in the Long Term. And it's a group of, of people that has been focusing more and more on 
long-term investing through companies. And the number of companies that have, have said, I'd rather be private, Absolutely. or I want to stay private longer until I can get better growth, um, it, it's amazing. And it's one of the reasons that we're finding in the private space that there are lots and lots of opportunities. doesn't mean they won't IPO at some point in time, but they're trying, and, and given the wall of money that actually is in the private equity space and frankly in the infrastructure space, um, this whole rooting of money through into private entities that want to stay private is, is something we've been witnessing now for quite some time. I agree the downside from a public investor's perspective may be somewhat, somewhat limiting, but I think the preoccupation with every little tick of, of, of share price has, has really, at the end of the day, caused people to step back and rethink it. Well, but, but social I, I, media doesn't help. I, was, I, I agree with that. Uh, certainly the short-term pressure uh, is something that no companies really like to deal with. The other thing we have to look at, though, is regulation. And what's happened, are there, are there impacts in our equity markets that uh, regulation has had on it, too? You know, as an example, Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, the environment's very different for a lot of companies, and, and the burdens that are imposed on public companies from a regulatory and reporting perspective are pretty significant. So if you can achieve the same benefits in the private markets, why wouldn't you do that as long as you could? And, and we will see that. In 2018, I believe that we will see an unprecedented number of public companies going private, backed by private equity. And yeah. I think that's a worry. I mean, I, I think the, the reasons why, I think Ron articulates them well, but we should be worried about this. This is the de-democratization of, of markets, and it's going to contribute to the income inequality and the perception of income inequality. In the United States today, um, half of all Americans hold no, have, any savings they have would be in a traditional bank. Those that are participating in markets are typically participating in a workplace plan. So of that half, that takes account for 80%. So if you're taking that opportunity, to invest in public markets away or limiting it. You know, David makes a good point, right, that some of the fastest growth companies that used to actually get their ramp up through some of these, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, through some of these small cap mutual funds, they don't need to go that way anymore. So we should be worried about that. But it also goes back to, Kate, your, your, your point about, it, it ties into this 145 trillion. Where's that money coming from, right? I mean, some of it is, Financial markets tend to grow at a multiple of the real economy, so you're seeing growth there. But you're also seeing, um, through regulatory changes, much of what normally would be either in a bank or in a public market is actually going into the private market. So think about credit, right? With all the regulation we've seen on banks, the massive boom in private credit, I mean, look around this conference, right? How many private credit managers are here? And they're serving a very important role in filling a void that wasn't there before. But think about the ability now to actually oversee that. So the regulators have accomplished in the credit space exactly what they wanted, right? They wanted to take the risk out of banks. They wanted to take the systemic risk out of it, so they've done that. They've pushed it out into private land. They've pushed it out into the shadow banking system. But how should we think about that? I mean, in some ways, we should probably feel good about it because risk is distributed. On the other hand, you're seeing this massive growth there, and is, is there some need for some kind of regulation on that side? I, I agree with what, what's been said over here. I think it is alarming to see this. I mean, we're uh, you know, pro-markets folks. I think there's lots of virtue in having liquidity and transparency mm -hmm. and so on. Regulation is necessary. Uh, some amount of uh, governance is, is very important, but we might have gone too far. What I was encouraged by, some of us were at a lunch in a, in a private session with uh, you know, members of Congress and uh, some folks from the, the SEC, is that I think that the, the regulators uh, and the lawmakers are well aware that the pendulum may have swung too far, and it was encouraging for them to hear that they are you know, focused on this issue and concerned. So hopefully we will see some better balance in the years to come that will sort of restore the, the right risk and rewards for you know, staying private or being public uh, without the, the overly onerous uh, regulation and compliance requirements. Let, let's uh, have a quick discussion at least about technology. Um, Ron, Ron O'Hanley, uh, you guys have embarked on this digitization effort. You're running ahead of schedule in terms of the cost savings. I think you were predicting 550 million uh, in, by 2020 and you're running ahead. 
Why was there a need to digitize aggressively? Had you fallen behind in that area? And what were your objectives when you set out for customers? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it was as much about falling behind as, it, as much about staying ahead. Mm. I mean, if you think about the, <clears throat> the system in which we all operate, there's, um, it, it's been built up through different kinds of technology, typically wrapped around a particular asset class. So I don't know the history of how PGAM started, but I can imagine it started out in one area, and each time it added an asset class, there was a new order management system, new technology. And we then customized. <laughs> and then we customized. We all customized because we could, and we could afford it because the, the cost didn't matter. Right? So you've got this system now that um, actually um, appears automated, but it's automated until one system has to talk to another. So we started out with our own digitization and um, making the, uh, the, the ability for all of our transactions from front to back to pass through digitally. The second part of that is, I mean, we serve institutions like PGIM. And to be able to enable them to have their, to, for their own investment process, their own operations to be able to, to digitize. But it goes beyond that. Um, think about blockchain and think about what we were just talking about earlier about liquidity and lack of liquidity in the marketplace. So you've got now ETFs that hold bank loans. And now the ETF holder gets liquidity in 24 hours. Settling a bank loan takes 18 days. So we're working very hard with blockchain and those that actually syndicate the bank loans to say, you put out a new loan, put it out in blockchain, we can actually cut down that, that settlement time and reduce that amount of liquidity mismatch. I use it just as an example of that's where the technology needs to go. If you really want to make sure, if you think about somebody like Two Sigma and the speed at which they move and the speed at which they're transacting, the rest of the system oftentimes can't keep up with it. And that's really what all of us have to do to keep that system moving. You guys are doing something interesting in terms of uh, exporting your technology to customers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that business initiative and, and how you provide solutions without having your own clients cannibalize what you're doing in the markets or what you're doing for efficiency? Yep. So look, we are in a way fortunate because we had the opportunity to start from a virtually clean sheet of paper in 2001. Our founders had that vision and you know, recognized pretty early that trying to uh, you know, build this from legacy systems or vendor systems, et cetera, was going to be futile. So they set out to build a very different kind of company. And so we had the luxury of doing this. And I just want to be mindful, it's not just technology. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, we've got to invest more in technology. It's a combination of technology, data, and human capital that makes it possible. And what has changed, really, is you have to have a scientific mindset. It's not just about throwing technology dollars at the problem. Uh, that is you know, an artifact, but it is really about having a scientific mindset to make data-driven decisions. And that, that DNA, that mindset, is a very, very profound change, which we all have to, and our children have to get prepared for, for, for the next several decades, because we are living in a world which will become much more data rich, and every business is going to be making decisions using data and hypotheses in a scientific framework that's already uh, happening. And so that mindset shift is really what's, what's critical. Um, I think a number of people are recognizing that and are recognizing that it's really hard to do this in-house. And this could mean a under-resourced pension plan, or this could mean a very well-resourced large asset manager who has come to the conclusion that they sort of need to reinvent their platform, reinvent themselves, but it's going to be very, very difficult. It's not just about hiring three PhDs and two data scientists uh, to, that will get them there. And so in partnership with, with both uh, our clients, the institutional investors, and in fact some, some folks that you consider cooperators, uh, we reflected on whether we could take some of our internal capabilities, unbundle them, and deliver them as a service to help our institutional investors achieve a greater impact for their whole portfolio, not the, just the tiny little slice that they hire to Sigma to manage, because look, we manage $50 billion, that's a great business, but our clients manage $5 trillion. And if we want to be more helpful to them beyond what they entrust us with, how can we affect their whole portfolios? And so the idea was born out of that, is can we take our optimization technology, can we take our execution technology, can we take some of the capabilities we've built for ourselves, adapt them, 
productize them and deliver them as a service. And we've been, it's, it's been very, very well received, both by our institutional investing clients and by our partners who may on the surface look like competitors, but frankly would be clients of our uh, licensed technology. When did you start this? This effort really started five years ago. Um, and you know we have now uh, productized the, the institutional solution, which is now installed with 60 institutions in the US and in Europe and going to Asia soon. Uh, they're using it you know, every day, every week. Uh, and then as far as you know, the asset manager solution, uh, we have uh, one very large multi-hundred billion dollar asset manager that is using our execution uh, technology to trade every day uh, for you know, over a year. So just, just uh, I don't mean to be the downsayer on, on technology, because it clearly is important. We but, need a better um, case. But, um, you know, and we were one of the very earliest firms to get into quant investing. We've been man we manage a lot of money that way, and, and we've been doing it for a long time. And I think the lesson of that is that it's actually really hard. And I do worry that the media, and I know if I put AI in front of a fund right now, I could raise a lot of money. And I think expectations are now way ahead of what we can actually deliver on. Which doesn't mean that over time there isn't a substantial opportunity to improve the investment processes that we have, whether it's in real estate or equities or fixed income, by the use of machine learning, other kinds of artificial intelligence. But it's actually extremely difficult. You spend you know, days and days coming up with false signals. You find that a lot of the data isn't nearly as clean as you'd hoped. And so I just, I just want us to be cautious as we go down the kind of technology is the answer to all things path. Um, it will help. Um, at the end of the day, though, at least active management will be still about um, very sophisticated judgments that people make with the use of very good data and technology. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's absolutely, AI is totally overhyped. Um, you know, whether it's in the finance industry, you could put AI on a fund and it'll sell better, or in a washing machine, and you know, suddenly you can charge more for it. It, it is, it's actually getting ridiculous <laughs> how people are uh, using and misusing this terminology. AI has had phenomenal uh, impact and progress, frankly, beyond anyone's imagination over the last five years, even according to experts. The progress that we've made in, in narrow fields of AI, from machine vision to NLP to speech recognition, that we see every day with, with Siri and Echo and, and, and so on and so forth, is, is truly mind-boggling. But it is solving fairly narrow and precise problems. Our business is actually not stationary and is constantly evolving. And so I think human context is extremely important. So it is a combination of identifying the right technique to use it for the right data set, but with the right human context, which, which is important. Look, that's why we have 1,400 people. It's not an easy problem. We're really hard at work on this. Uh, but I completely agree. AI has, has some limitation, and, and we have to be humble to recognize uh, you know, what it's right for. We're still a long ways away from you know, what is known as, as general artificial intelligence. <laughs> Steve, okay, you're th smiling. These, these probably aren't positions we're supposed to take at the Milken Institute on something like <laughs> I love AI, it right? And, and the other thing I do is I want to preface my comments on technology by a guy who still uses his flip phone. Oh, uh, my. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Good battery but, life on that. <laughs> but, I, but I agree. What Wait, you, that's said. just a prop, right? No, you that's my phone. Use it. Okay. <laughs> I'll text you on it later. <laughs> that has a texting capability? Of course it okay. does. <laughs> that's all you need is a text and a you know, phone. Okay. But, You're uh, giving me ideas for my nine year old son. Go yeah. on. <laughs> so, but uh, Noble, Noble's comments, I think, um, we're, we're playing around in this, but what I'd say on the whole concept is we're at such early stages. Uh, it's going to be years before we really see, I think, dramatic applications in, in our industry. And maybe I'll be wrong in three years, but at least that's the way I see it now. But we're doing things too, and it, a lot of it really rev revolves around, I think, where Noble started, which is data. I mean, we're producing a lot more data today than we ever have, and we also have the ability to process a lot of that data that we didn't have, and I think those capabilities are going to continue to improve too. So, so for us, it's really a lot about um, you know, data analytics, you know, what can we learn from the data, can we test what we do as humans and compare it to what, we're, what, uh, what the machines might come out of it. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of a way to start in the business. But um, you know, I, I've thought about this as really kind of, we're still in, the, in what, I, what I call the man and machine environment now, where, where uh, what we're learning from data analysis, from if you want to call it AI or technology, is really assisting the decisions that we make. 
And I think it's going to be a long time before we're talking about replacing humans and what we do. And you know, I think David made comments ah, that so, I agree with. So, so let me clarify. This is actually, so, so yes, man and machine is a good combination. There's a very significant and profound difference between computer-assisted human trading and human-assisted computer trading. And we might disagree on which one is, yeah. is prevailing. We are the first ones to recognize that humans have an extremely important role. They are the ones who code the algorithms, they provide context, they uh, have a, a certain intuition. It's, uh, we, we, are, we are far from not having humans. We've been growing our firm every year because we think that that's really, really important. But make no mistake, it is not about technology-assisted human trading. That, that mindset is actually flawed. In this world where data explosion is taking place, and we're dealing with just a, you know, an exponential growth, an exabyte of data being created every hour. Uh, well, I mean, big data is a misnomer anyways. You know, big data really should be an ocean of small data with big noise. And, and that, that's really what we're, uh, what we're confronted with. That does require a very scientific approach to uh, considering how to harness this data and uh, you know, how to make decisions. And so, we are, I mean, our, our algorithms are making decisions using uh, large amounts of data. Uh, and so we, we really believe in, uh, you know, human-assisted AI trading. Yeah, well, and actually, I mean, isn't that also one of the risks in this, though, too, Noble, that you're right, it's human-assisted. The humans are the ones writing the algorithms. So there's still right. that opportunity for bias, for, uh, you know, uh, any in, in individual views in, in developing that. Well, that's no, one there's, of the potential well, risks, no, I think. No, if you take a good, rigorous scientific mindset, you, uh, you know, and you, you are, that's, that's actually what science is about. You can actually rid yourself of a lot of the, these biases. I mean, yes, if you do sloppy research, there's all kinds of risks of overfitting. Uh, and that actually is the scary part when we hear this hype about machine learning, right. because uh, you know you could be over, you, you could be making all kinds of overfitting relating mistakes. You could be, uh, you know recognizing patterns that no longer make sense. Uh, you could just be relying on spurious correlations without any human context. And then the worst of all is you may be actually inhaling your own fumes and believing that this is working because everyone's doing right. the same thing, and that usually ends very badly. So uh, it, it is. So rigorous and, and you know, thorough scientific research is, uh, is, is, you know, it's like any other field. It's R&D. Can I, can I jump in? So yes, please. Well, I wanted to uh, weigh in on technology, and I also wanted to ask you about the humans. And, so this uh, is where I was going. <laughs> Everybody's talking about technology, and it's interesting because we're thinking about this now. When, over the next decade, a uh, simple statistic, this may not apply to the States, it certainly does in Canada, there's more people over the age of 60 years of, of age than there is under the age of, not, of 20 years. Mm. That's a spread. Roll that spread out 10 to 12 to 15 years. Think about the technology we've been talking about and start asking the question, if we are to continue in the asset management industry, attracting talent, bringing in a value proposition for young people coming into the asset management business today, or in our case, in the pension industry, what's the value proposition for them going forward? What does it mean for a changing talent attraction process? How do we attract, retain, and get young people fully engaged. Once upon a time, you'd see a pile of traders swaggering around some trading floor. Now they've got data scientists and, and, and researchers and all sorts of people uh, plugging into the process. I know in our case, we're very actively uh, looking at the next decade of talent attraction, the value proposition, and, and when you think about the pool and the demographics, particularly in a number of large G7 type countries, that talent attraction story is not an insignificant one. And the competition for talent, because if we are going more technologically uh, driven and every single MIT class is being hoovered up by uh, every technology comp comp company, Google or Apple or Netflix or whoever it is out there, how do we now compete in an asset management world to get at that same kind of talent? And, and I don't think that's an insignificant question for this industry to be facing over the next uh, even two to five years. I know it's already happening, but it's, it, it, it clearly is going to come to some kind of a crunch at some stage of the game if it hasn't already. And so I was uh, at my MBA school the other day, I was talking with the dean. He said, I was absolutely shocked. One of the large companies in the big, big, big name companies, we know them all. 
He said they came and they basically took the entire class. The entire graduating class was lifted out of, out of, the, out of the faculty. And I think to myself, this will be an issue for us as we roll into the future. How do we get this talent attraction story going for the next decade? So just maybe a couple of comments on the, on the U.S. situation, because I think this is something that Canada has actually done wonderfully uh, well. But the buy side in general in the U.S. has benefited, I think, very substantially from the downsizing that's happened in the sell side. Uh, and there's been a lot of talent that's been, uh, been available to move over. And many of the activities, if you just look at research, for example, um, you know, I have hundreds of people doing research that 15 years ago would have been done on the sell side. And so the, there's been a real migration of talent, I think, into the buy side, and that's been uh, really important. Where it hasn't gone, though, is yet to my clients. Mm. Um, and when I look around at some of the most important challenges of public plans in the United States, it's actually paying and attracting and retaining high-quality investment staff. And they, they, they really need that. Uh, many of them are struggling with this. They need technology. Uh, people and you know you all have been able to do that and I think that if the US could take a page out of the book that you've created around the talented investors that you've been able to attract we would be in a lot better spot than we are yeah no I agree I think Canada <coughs> is, a, is a model in terms of the governance they've created mm -hmm. for pension plans and the resulting talent that they've been able to attract and retain I think many countries struggle with that the US uh, amongst them uh, just on the, on the point that Ron was making earlier, I think, you know, uh, being able to compensate a competitively is, is an aspect, but the world's best scientists and engineers are going to be attracted and motivated by more than that. Mm -hmm. right. They're going to look for a culture, they're going to look for an environment where they can continue to learn. They want, they want to look for a, you know, be surrounded with like-minded people uh, and, a, you know, a DNA of, of innovation. And that, that is very difficult to... Um, you know, iterate yourself into. I'd, I'd, I'd add to that that I think the way for us to attract talent is to remember why we're here. Um, as I said earlier, it's not our money. We're here to help people realize their hopes and dreams. And I think that mission is very inspirational to a lot of this generation coming forward, number one. Number two, the diversity of talent we need is much broader than it used to be. You know, if you were hiring for a fund manager 30 years ago, you basically wanted a researcher. You wanted a fundamental analyst, a uh, very narrow set of skills that you were looking for. Today, we need all sorts of things. I always say to my group, who's the most important person in the firm, the CIO or the CIO, the chief investment officer or the chief information officer? Mm -hmm. The answer is they're both important. And it's those kind, we need people from, from both those disciplines coming forward. We also don't need to be limited to the U.S. I mean, this is a great That's opportunity really to be attracting talent from elsewhere. We've got people on the ground at State Street, large po uh, pools of people doing technology in China, doing operations in technology in Poland, doing operations in technology in India. If we can, we've got an immigration issue that we have to deal with. And it's a I big was issue. about to ask about uh, that. I don't know that we'll solve that in on the one minute panel. and 12 <laughs> seconds we have left. Um, but, but, but the talent is there, uh, and it's a, it's a there's much more, it's a more broader pool of talent that's required. It's an important mission. It's an admission that inspires people. So I think we can solve this talent problem. Steve, I'd final say, word. And, yeah, and by final the way, word you is, you know, I, I think we transition like we do through almost any era. And technology won't just be an industry. I mean, technology is a trait that we need and part of everything we do. So people won't go to work because they want to go to a technology company, they're going to go to a business that excites them that is technology infused and technology is part of building and growing that business. You guys announced today that your CFO is retiring. Does that bring you closer to uh, becoming CEO? <laughs> I don't think anything changes. Okay. Good talent question though, right? Yes. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I enjoyed it. Thank uh, you, thank you to much. our audience. Thank you. <laughs>